Hello, this is Ms. Suchitra Parikh, Principal of Ramnivas Bajaj English High School and we are back in the lesson on reproductive parts of the plant and the process of reproduction. We studied about the parts of the flower and how they are modified to help in reproduction. We come to the next stage, the actual process of reproduction which begins with pollination. What is pollination? Pollination is the process by which the pollen from the anther reaches the stigma of a flower of the same species. Yes, the pollen, there are many pollens all around and if they fall on just any flower it's and on its stigma, it's not called pollination. Pollination is said to have occurred only when the pollen falls on the stigma that also a matured stigma of the same species flower. So pollination is the process by which pollen grains are transferred from the anther of one flower to stigma of another flower or maybe to its own stigma but of the same species is important. Uh, that says pollination is of two types, self-pollination and cross-pollination. Self-pollination can occur between the same flower. That means the pollen grain of a flower falls on its own stigma. Self-pollination is also when the pollen grain of a flower falls on the stigma of another flower but of the same plant. In other words, self-pollination means the genetic content of the uh, pollen and the ovule is the same. Common genetic character is important for self-pollination. The first type where it falls on the same flower, it's called autogamy. When self-pollination is between the stigma, anther and the stigma of the same flower, we call it autogamy. When it is from one flower to another flower on the same plant, then it's called gitanogamy or gitanogamy. Both pronunciation are acceptable. A neighbor, gitano is neighboring. The cross-pollination, sorry, self-pollination can happen in bisexual flower as well as in unisexual flower. In bisexual flower, very obviously, if the stigma and the anther mature at the same time, then it is possible that the pollen grain from the anther will fall on its own stigma that is matured and for that the two have to be more or less of similar height or the stigma has to be lying shorter means style has to be shorter than the stamens the filaments. In unisexual flower one would wonder how self pollination occur. We have the gitanogamy wherein the pollen of a flower may fall on the stigma of flower of the same genetic content means another flower of the same plant. There are plants that has both the unisexual flowers, the male flowers also and female flowers also on the same plant, very often on the same axis. Uh, axis that contains many flowers is called inflorescence. There are inflorescence, inflorescence is such where the male flowers are found on top of the inflorescence and the female flowers are found in the bottom part of the inflorescence and in such cases self-pollination is the rule. Cross-pollination is also called allogamy. Allo refers to others. Very clearly, when pollen grain of a flower falls on stigma of another flower which is situated on totally another plant, then it is called cross-pollination. It is often carried out by way of an agency. For self-pollination, an agent may or may not be needed. But for cross-pollination, an agent is a must. There are advantages and disadvantages to both, self-pollination as well as to cross-pollination. Let's look at first the advantages of self-pollination. First and foremost, that it is sure. It is less likely to fail, so at least pollination will take place and fertilization will occur, seed formation, fruit formation, has to occur. 
So it is sure in bisexual flower. Of course, the condition is that the stigma and the anther must mature at the same time. Also, another advantage is that the parental characteristics are retained. There are times when one does not want the characteristic of a flower or a fruit or a particular tree to change. Then self-pollination is very helpful. Of course, there is no wastage of pollen grains because in transferring from one plant to another plant, a lot can get wasted. It may fall in a place where it is not fertilization. It's not going to lead to fertilization and therefore is not pollination at all. So there's no wastage of pollen grains in self-pollination. Also, that the flowers don't need uh, to attract any insects, etc. So all the showy, all the uh, vegetative matter need not be wasted in creating attractive flowers and things like that. And of course, no scent, no nectar is needed as there is no obvious agent required. So these are the advantages of self-pollination. What are the disadvantages of self-pollination? Uh, over a period of time, from one generation to another to another, if a plant is reproducing by self-pollination, then the next generation continues to become weaker and weaker. So in due course of time, that species is likely to vanish or at least become very, very rare, becomes less in number. And uh, the seeds that are produced as a result of self-pollination are also weak. That is, say, uh, lesser percentage, lesser proportion of the seeds produced when sown in the soil will give rise to new plant. And the generation is more prone to diseases. The next generation that is produced as a result of self-pollination can easily get weak and diseased. Some defective characters can enter in and... If they are there existing, they cannot be removed. So that defect also continues to uh, move on or be carried forward from one generation to another. And very obviously, because of the weakening, as I said, the yield, the, if you use it for crops, for flowers, for fruits, then the yield is very much reducing from one generation to another. The new variety can just never be formed in uh, self-pollination. So these are the disadvantages of self-pollination. And that is why probably nature avoids and rather promotes cross-pollination. In that case, let us see what are the advantages of cross-pollination. Why does nature favor cross-pollination? Because first and foremost, the offspring is healthier. That is, the next generation is healthier because of mixing of characteristics. The seeds produced are uh, viable and abundant. Viable means more seeds are likely to give rise to new plant when sown in the soil and the number of seeds produced by any generation are much more than they would uh, do by self-pollination. And because of mixing of characters, genetic material is mixed and therefore there are newer varieties produced whenever there is cross-pollination happening. But to this also there are some disadvantages. Disadvantages are comparatively lesser than that of the self-pollination. That is to say that a pollinating agent is always needed. Also, there is a lot of wastage in transference from one plant to another plant. And of course, a lot of uh, showiness, etc. is required and a lot of modifications are required for agents to bring about this pollination. Particularly when it has to happen through insects or even through wind or through other animals. There's a lot of uh, adaptation and therefore vegetative matter added to the flower to make it possible to attract agencies of pollination. How does nature favor cross-pollination? While we were looking at advantages and disadvantages, we said that nature favors cross-pollination. What are the different ways? How do we come to this conclusion that nature favors cross-pollination? When we see in the advanced angiosperms, the evolution of uh, plants from algae to the higher flowering plants, the flowers that we are studying, the angiosperms, we find that more and more favor is in the direction of having unisexual flowers. A lot of plants favor cross-pollination by having unisexual flowers. If the unisexual flowers are on different plants, then cross-pollination is ensured. 
but even if the unisexual flowers are on the same plant then also if the maturity period is different for the two flowers the self pollination is totally avoided and cross pollination is totally favored you will find papaya plant the two plants are separate there is a male plant and there is a female plant otherwise the plants look alike except when the flowers and the fruits are born another good example uh, we see is in uh, pumpkins they also have unisexual flowers so unisexuality is an important characteristic in favor of cross pollination and to prevent self pollination uh, dicogamy is uh, another uh, characteristic that those flowers which are bisexual having both male male parts and the female parts the anthers and the stigma have different maturity time in uh, those flowers where anthers mature first the condition is called protandry pro first proto protandry andry androsium protandry is the condition in a bisexual flower where anthers mature only when anthers have all their pollen grains uh, taken away and gone they are given away only then does the stigma mature though the flower is bisexual but it's behaving like a unisexual flower at any one time similarly there are some other flowers in which there is a condition of protogyny gyny refers to gynoecium proto refers to first so gynoecium matures first stigma matures first and then once the stigma's function is over it's uh, shriveling and dying off then the anthers mature and produce the pollen grain very obviously no chance of its own anthers falling on its own stigma to bring about pollination or fertilization so dicogamy is another such condition that favors cross pollination self sterility in some bisexual flowers if by any chance by any means the anther and the stigma they mature at the same time but if the pollen falls on its own stigma the stigma will reject it it will not allow the pollen tube to grow and uh, do, will not let the male gamete reach the female gamete in the ovary inside in the ovule for fertilization so self sterility it behaves as if it is sterile the stigma behaves as if it is sterile when its own pollen falls on it so that's called self sterility again affecting cross pollination hercogamy hercos means barrier a physical barrier exists in case of some flowers the anther and the stigma matures at the same time but one of the petal or a part of the flower or an anther is broadened in such a manner uh, 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 part of any one vegetative part or any part the filament sometimes can come in the way it creates a physical barrier between the stigma and the anther so there is just no chance of the pollen its own pollen to fall on its own stigma then it does not matter if the two mature at the same time a physical barrier uh, you can see in this example a kind of a hood has been created around the stigma and therefore its own pollen cannot fall on it its own stigma heterostyly is another very interesting uh, situation that we find in some uh, flowers hetero means many different the styles style is uh, the part of the carpel which extends from the ovary to hold the stigma on top styles are of different sizes uh, if the uh, stigma that is present on the style is above the anther is long then the pollen cannot fall on it in some uh, flowers there are two types one variety where the style is short and another variety where the style is long in the long type self pollination is totally avoided and some short type are produced nature wants to survive there is a struggle for existence so just in case no cross pollination 
was possible so that the species may not perish. So this variety of plant they produce also some flowers which has short style. So heterostyly, it is exactly the same species of flower but it has style of two different sizes in some different flowers. So heterostyly is again another condition in which uh, we can see cross pollination is generally favored but at the same time for the want of not perishing the small styles are also visible. For bringing about this pollination particularly cross pollination agents are required from one plant to another plant which is at a distant place the pollens cannot just fly and go on its own though wind as one of the carrier yes they do fly through the wind there are some pollen pollens are a variety of shapes and sizes there are some are as if with wings they have some extended membrane which looks like wing but pollens definitely have some spiky spiny material around the surface around and they therefore get caught easily whenever they reach there are uh, agents of uh, pollination like uh, wind, the water, the insects are the most commonly known agents of pollination. Then there are birds, there are animals, even large animals like monkeys and even elephant are found to help in pollination. Human beings also become agents of pollination in many cases. So there are many many agents of pollination to name the five main ones. It's insects, wind, water, birds, animals. Uh, of the variety of agencies of pollination, it is important that a flower is adapted, is modified in such a way that it lends itself to be, mod to be pollinated by a particular agent. Insect pollinated flower. Insects, the word for that is entomophilos. So entomophilos or insect pollinated flower, entomos refers to insect. Philae refers to affinity, having attraction for. So the flowers attract insect towards them. They have a special characteristic. In fact, the common flowers that we know of are entomophilous flowers. We know always flowers to be colorful, showy, large, bright, having some smell, nectar. These are the characteristics of an entomophilous flowers. And uh, these flowers are either small, then they are found in cluster. And if they are large, then they may be found singly. Large and singly found flowers, common is our shoe flower, and small and flowers in a cluster are our like sunflowers. The special characteristics of wind pollinated flower. Wind pollinated flower, the wind has to be able to pass through the anther to carry the pollen away, and it has to pass through close to the stigma so that the stigma will pick up some of these pollen. How does that happen? The filaments if they are long and hanging, anther if they are long and they can sway as you will find in spider lily. Long filament and pretty long anther sticking to the filament only by the tip, versatile anthers as they are called. With the slightest moving wind, they keep swaying and they are uh, able to allow the pollen grain to dust off into the wind. So the pollen grain gets dusted into the wind. Like particles of dust, the pollen gets carried away and in case as the wind is blowing, it happens to touch a stigma that is mature, it will pick up. Some pollen will get stuck to the mature stigma of another spider uh, lily flower and pollination would be affected. So such flowers, they don't need scent, they don't need bright colors, they can be dull, drab. In fact, in most cases, like in the grasses, the wind pollination is uh, the way and the flowers, we talked of perianth earlier, the calyx and the corolla looking alike and in this case, the calyx and corolla are neither petaloid nor sepaloid, they are like thin membranes and these uh, scale like perianth they are very very reduced they only have the purpose of protecting and safeguarding the flower in the bud condition and in the matured state 
they do not interfere, they do not come in the way of the wind so that it can easily pollinate the flower. So long stamens, long style, hanging uh, uh, stigma, hanging uh, and uh, easily moving versatile anther are the characteristic of uh, wind pollinated flower. Also one very important characteristic is about the pollen grain of a wind pollinated flower. They are very, very light, very, very tiny and smooth surface. I was talking about spooky, spiny surfaces. These are smooth surface because spiny surface would interfere, would, would provide friction and resistance into the blowing wind and the pollen may not be easily carried away by the wind. So smooth surface is speciality of characteristics of wind pollinated flowers. Water pollinated flower. This is also very interesting. The plants that grow in water, they flower in water. The pollination occurs through the agency of water. In some cases, the pollen grain just fall off and with the movement of the water, we know that water is always in a state of constant motion. It may end up reaching another flower where it can get stuck to the stigma and pollination is affected. Pollen grains of uh, such wind pollinated, uh, sorry, water pollinated flowers have uh, density such, a specific gravity such, sorry, that it can float just above the surface of water. And therefore, there is any flower growing over there, it can easily pollinate. So, because of its specific uh, uh, gravity such that it can easily get floating, it remains afloat. There is an interesting water plant called Vallisneria, where a matured flower just detaches itself and meets another flower and pollination is affected. Uh, Bird pollinated flowers. Bird pollinated flowers are often found pollinated by birds with long beak and often curved beak. So the flowers are all tubular in shape if they have to be pollinated by bird. So the birds with their beak try to reach the nectary and they often have nectary in the base of the flower. So when the birds try to reach the nectary, some birds even feed on the pollen. Some bird feed on the filament of the flower. So they try to reach these parts which are inside the tubular corolla and in that process some pollen gets stuck to their beak or the stigma rubs against it and therefore picks up the pollen. Yes, in case of all the agents of pollination, this is the process. When insect is visiting one flower and flying off to another flower, it's collecting pollen from one and it is depositing the pollen on the stigma of another flower. Similarly, the wind it may be picking up the pollen also and in that same wind when the stigma is hanging, stigma is picking up the pollen also. Same case with the birds. Uh, a very interesting example is seen in one of the African flower called Reflacia. It is a very huge flower growing close to the ground. When it's full, uh, When it is fully matured and grown, the pollen uh, gets stuck to the feet of the elephant. Uh, elephant while it is moving in the jungle and uh, it walks over this flower also, it is pretty huge and while it walks over it, if the matured pollen are present on the flower, they will get stuck to the feet of the elephant and the elephant while it is moving around, it may walk over another Reflacia flower which may have the stigma matured and these pollen may get stuck to that matured stigma and affecting pollination. So elephant pollinated flower elephophily is the condition. Seeing this in nature, man always keeps learning from nature. One learning that man has done is about artificial pollination. There are certain selected characteristics of one plant that man wants to combine with another plant. So to bring this about in a very conscious manner, artificial pollination is affected. It is a very good means of also trying, experimenting and producing newer varieties of plants. The artificial pollination can be done by actually taking one flower whose pollen grains are mature and physically bringing it close to the mature stigma of another flower and having to manually touch it. Uh, very often pollens are collected if they are uh, such that they may easily fall off uh, by plucking 
that little jerk also can make the pollen fall off in some cases. So in that case, very gently it's taken on a paintbrush and very gently the paintbrush is touched to the matured stigma of another flower and uh, pollination is affected. There are many different ways in which man has found ways and means of bringing about artificial pollination for producing a kind of variety that one desires. Uh, one uh, or two interesting examples, let us uh, see a specific example that uh, I would like to talk about is of a pea flower. It is important to first see the structure of a pea flower before understanding how pollination occurs in a pea flower. Uh, the pea flower, a whole flower is shown to you over here. You can see it is not the usual kind of corolla. Uh, usually what we have seen of corolla is five petals and all of similar type. But here the five petals are of three different types. There is a standard petal which is large one. There are two wing petals which opens out on the side of the standard and there are two small inner one keel petal which join together to form a particular kind of a shape. This gives a tunnel like appearance to the pea flower. You can see a standard petal. Uh, wing and a keel shown to you separately. Inside this, inside the keel, the stamen and the uh, pistil are present. The pistil here has a style which is taller and stands out above the stamens, above the anthers. Now, what happens in this case? The conspicuous standard petal, that is where the bee comes and alights. It is the bee's uh, place for sitting. As it sits over there and it tries to push its way through the wing petal and its body is rubbing against it. Uh, you see that the position of the anther and the stigma is from below that. So it is touching the body, the abdomen of the bee as it is making its way into the wing petal and in between the keel, it has to push its head into. So ensuring that enough of rubbing of pollen takes place onto the body of the insect as it tries to reach the nectary at the base of the flower. Similarly, in case the stigma is matured, we can see the uh, anther and the stigma both are matured and they are rubbing, they would be rubbing against the body of the uh, insect as it is making its way into the wing and the keel. So if the stigma is matured and if it is rubbing against the body and if there are pollen grains present on the bee, then it would pick it up. Yes, in nature there are a lot of these if and if and if, but there are so very many chances, the number of pollen grains produced are so very many and so many different agents that finally pollination is affected and fertilization does take place, seeds and flowers and fruits are formed. Another interesting example uh, we take of a wind pollinated flower, the maize. Uh, maize is a wind pollinated flower. The corn that we eat are the fruits of the maize plant. On top, you will find on top of the corn, there are some as if not so grown corn. Those were the male flowers over there and where the corn is formed, the seed that we eat or the grain that we eat, corn, is where the female flowers were. We talked of an inflorescence where unisexual flowers, male flowers are found on top of the inflorescence, female flowers on top are found on the bottom part of the inflorescence, corn is one such example. So the tassels that is there in the uh, top, all those uh, uh, golden hairy stuff that we see, they are the filaments. So the uh, anther and the stigma, uh, anther and the stigma just hangs out, uh, dusting off pollen grains into the air as well as collecting pollen grains by this long golden hair. So that is another interesting example that we can see of uh, unisexual flowers on a single stalk inflorescence where wind pollination is affected. 